Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. So the mythology of some of the world's religions has actually been the basis for a lot of really good genre entertainment. In the realms of literature, we have things like Edward M. Erdelak's The Merkaba Writer, which is a weird Western series that uh, melds together elements of the Cthulhu mythos with elements of Jewish mysticism and the Kabbalah. And this is incredibly cool. One of my favorite weird Western series of all time. Highly, highly recommend the Merkaba Writer series. In the realms of science fiction, we have things like Philip K. Dick's Vallis Trilogy or the Divine Invasion Trilogy, but his trilogy dealing with Gnostic Christianity and his lived truth of being beamed by a pink of light from an entity called Vallis, which might have been God, and how he has dealt, how Philip K. Dick dealt with some of these weird things that happened in his life. But his trilogy of Christian-based uh, science fiction is The Divine Invasion, The Transmigration of Timothy Archer and Vallis. And these are three of my favorite Philip K. Dick novels. Continuing in the realms of science fiction, of course, we also have the very popular A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter M. Miller Jr. And this is just a fantastic novel all about this kind of post-apocalyptic dark ages where a group of monks at an abbey or at a, at a monastery, I should say, uh, they uh, continue the traditions of... Of, of writing and they write technical manuals and and schematics for uh, electronics as ancient kind of religious texts and it's really an interesting book highly recommend a canticle for Leibowitz if you have not read it and then of course in the realms of kind of folklore and mythology we have uh, the journey to the west which is kind of a grand and epic fantasy mythology based on on Buddhism and this the, the journey to the west has been the basis for dozens of amazing movies especially in Hong Kong all the movies out by Stephen Chow and, and uh, even the basis of a very kind of loose basis for Dragon Ball. So the journey to the West is this kind of Buddhist mythology, Buddhist uh, fantasy that has influenced all kinds of awesome things. And in the realms of horror, of course, we have one of the best. My, one of my top five, five favorite authors is William Peter Blatty and his uh, trilogy of faith. Here we have The Exorcist, The Ninth Configuration and Legion. And each one of these books was basically written as a kind of uh, Christian apologetics of, of looking at the problems of evil and using that for the basis of good, for the basis of, of, of God and how God exists. And I, I mentioned all of that today because today on the channel we are taking a look at Deliverance. And Deliverance is a tactical skirmish board game that is based in Christian mythology. And in this game, the players will be playing as angels and the angels will be fighting demons as the demons come into this town and try to corrupt it. And it's up to the angels to prevent that from happening. Now, I am not the first and I will not be the last person to also mention uh, this famous book in, uh, in, in Christian fiction, and that would be This Present Darkness by Frank Peretti. Uh, people who grew up Christian in the 80s, I think it was a law that every Christian family had to own a copy of This Present Darkness. I know my family did as a Christian family growing up, and it was a book that I was always interested in. And so I'm going to be reviewing this game in kind of two parts. The first part of this video, we will just go over the game and how it plays. And I think it's a pretty fantastic skirmish game. But we did have some discussion on the uh, uh, on the Dungeon Dive Facebook group about this game being preachy or not. And so in the second part of this video, I will talk a little bit about that because I think I come 
uh, to that topic, maybe from a unique perspective, because I used to be a Christian for the first, I don't know, 25 or so years of my life. I was a Christian. I was heavily involved in the church. Both of my parents were ministers, but they were pretty liberal ministers. We had openly gay people in our in our church. Uh, my parents actually performed marriages for their gay friends. So it was maybe a kind of a unique Christian church, but um, I will talk a little bit about my perspective as to whether or not I feel this game is preachy. So the first part of this video will just be focused on the game. So let's get to that. Okay, first let's take a look at the back of the box here. Deliverance, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, Romans 12, 21. Since the victory on the cross, you have hunted the fallen princes that lead the demonic hordes from the shadows. After centuries of tracking, you have found a hotbed of activity in the unassuming town of Fallbrook. A strange darkness, perhaps this present darkness, <laughs> sits heavy upon the town, and the quiet cry for deliverance is heard among the humans. You tighten your grip on your blade and review your plan of espionage once more, for the father of lies is cun cunning. What demonic conspiracy hides within this town? Choose your hero and act as the hand of God against the forces of darkness controlled by the game itself. Blessed with the stewardship over heavenly relics and holy powers, unleash your God-given gifts to defeat demonic foes, cast down the darkness, and deliver the saints from evil through an epic campaign or a one to two hour skirmish perfect for a game night. Now, the game does come with some miniatures, and I should say uh, that I was provided this game as a review copy. I reached out to uh, Lowen Games and asked if I could review this game because I thought it sounded pretty interesting. I think it's kind of rare that we get a game in this kind of Christian space that isn't just kind of a cheap cash in on the religious aspect, because I think first and foremost, Deliverance is actually a really cool game. It's an interesting skirmish game, but you do get some minis and the minis are, are, are um, they are dipped or highlighted, I can't remember what this is called, sunburst or something, but uh, they, they do have some ink, they're, they're washed, that's what I'm trying to say. And I think they look pretty good, but I am actually using the standees just because you guys know, or people who watch the, the, the Dungeon Dive know that I prefer cardboard over plastic. But here we have the game set up, kind of uh, a couple turns into a skirmish version of the game. And we'll talk a little bit about the differences between the skirmish and campaign modes as we go. So Deliverance is primarily a combat-focused skirmish game. It's not really a dungeon crawl. It's not an adventure game. So don't go into it with those expectations. You can think of this as kind of like if you're into video games like uh, Final Fantasy Tactics or Vandal Hearts. And it's a uh, grid-based combat. And where this game really excels is in its variety in both in terms of the angels that the players play and the demons that the players are fighting. There is a lot of variety. There is a lot going on in those spaces. And I think it makes for some really, really interesting gameplay. So as far as the angels go, there are nine different angels that the players can play as. So we have Miko, the river, uh, the river watcher. We have Christine, the voice of thunder. Gabriel, the messenger of God. Michael, the archangel, Shula, the keeper of light, Taolu, the wind walker, and Uriel, the flame of God. And then in this game that I am playing right now, I am playing as Sardius, the stone speaker, and as Azriel, the angel of death. Now, Sardius, I think, is a really interesting uh, character here, and I like playing him just because of the way that he can manipulate the battlefield. We'll talk a little bit about the angels and their special powers as we go. But an angel will have two actions that they can take on their turn. They will have a number of different powers. Some of their powers will cost uh, courage to use. Some of their powers will gain courage that can later be spent to use other powers. And then the angels will also have a number of stats. So they have their health, uh, strength, smite, and wisdom. I can't exactly remember what these are, are called. 
uh, that's one thing where I think the game falls down a little bit is it doesn't really have a good uh, a good reference for all of the icons. It only has a small subset of the icons and those would be from your status effects. So I think having another reference sheet for the various icons would be really helpful uh, for this game. But the characters will also have on the back, they will have some lore and some inspiration and a play style. And this is really cool here. So uh, Sar Sardius is a living volcano empowered with control over the elements of the earth. His arms juxtapose two truths about his power. Raw power of a lava flow and glorious flora produced by a fertile soil. And then it'll give you a breakdown of how this character plays. He has low damage, high defense, he has a medium support and a low difficulty. So really interesting. Now, each one of these uh, angels, each one of these characters also comes with a deck of talent cards. And the talent cards are broken up into uh, kind of three different decks. So we have deck one, deck two, and deck three. And throughout the game, the players will earn experience points. And then you can spend experience points. And one of the things you can spend experience points on is to unlock your various talents. And so the first time you unlock a talent, you have to unlock one from your level one talent deck. And so right now, as Sardius, I have the Igneous Flora. And so this gives me a chance to roll a seven or higher and I can gain a shield or maybe do some some uh, some healing. And a shield is a token. It's a currency that you can spend to prevent damage to yourself. But there are all kinds of different abilities. Terraformer is an upgrade. Skipping stones, lava flow, churning earth. And so once I have unlocked a level one power, the next time I unlock a talent, I can go on to my level two powers. And the level two powers are a little bit more powerful. We have Aftershock, Under Pressure, Lava Burst, Harden, and Gem Cutter. And then as you guessed, after you unlock a level two power, then you can go on and unlock one of your level three powers. Desolation, Stones Cry Out, Stonebound, Hot Springs, and Earthquake. So there are one, two, three, four, five. So each angel has 15 unique talents and they're all different that they can unlock. And you can combine those in different ways to really help build out a character that feels unique. And all of the angels that I have played, and I have played as four different angels, they all feel very, very unique. But that's not the only way that you can make them unique. You can also spend experience to unlock loot. And those are in uh, this deck here of Heavenly Treasure. And when you unlock loot, you can draw two Heavenly Treasure cards and you can choose one to keep. There are items that you can wear on your chest, on your legs. We have different types of gloves and helms and weapons. And these will allow you to either, usually they will have some kind of extra power and they will also upgrade your core stats, such as your health or your strength or your smiting ability. So we have things like the Hope of Salvation Helm, the Greaves of Truth, uh, the Arraignment of Light, the Guardian's Gauntlets, the Dune Shade Myths. So of course you can wear one pair of gloves, you can have one weapon, you can have one item on your chest, uh, one item on your head and then one item on your legs. And so you can also build out your character with items. But as you play, you can have a combination of loot and of talents. And those coupled with your innate abilities make for some really, really interesting gameplay. And I have some of these angels are some of the most fun I've ever had playing a game like this. I would almost put this in the same category in terms of the heroic things that you can do as a player from one turn to the next. I think I would put this right up there with uh, Chronicles of Junagor, which is a game that I didn't love, but I loved that game on a player level just because of all of the cool things you could do. Now, the demons that the heroes will be fighting against, that the angels are fighting against, are also pretty interesting. So right now in my game, I'm fighting against the fallen Seraph and the Sandman. But we also have these minor demons here. We have the hateful fiends, the masked evil, the abomination, the unclean spirit, the meddling imps, and the cruel archers. And each one of these placards here for the enemies, again, will have some, it'll have some lore on the back there. 
And then it'll have a space for the four different uh, enemies because each one will be numbered and that will correspond to a place on the placard where you can put all of the, the damage that you've done to that enemy or some of the status effects like wither or cursed that you've applied to the enemy. And then these enemies will have, usually they will have one special power that they do at the beginning of their turn. For instance, the Cruel Archer, when he activates, it'll always uh, perform this black arrow action. And then he will take an action depending on what you roll on a D6. And so you will roll a D6 and then you will activate the corresponding action for that turn. And each, uh, the demons uh, operate in groups. So all of the cruel archers will go and then an angel will go and then the next group will go and then the next angel will go and so on. And in a skirmish game, you basically play one battle. So you will have, you will set up a tile, one tile, for each angel in play. So I'm playing with two. So we have two tiles set up. And we also have this kind of heavenly space over here where the angels, uh, they, they descend down from heaven into the battlefield. And so the angels start in heaven here. And then uh, depending on how many angels you have for each tile, you will have a group of demons. So here we in my game right now, I have the Sandman and the Fallen Seraph. And so I am just trying to battle those two groups of enemies. And then once I've defeated all of those enemies in the skirmish mode, you go into the next battle. And in the next battle, you actually fight against one group of minions. So a new group of minions. And you draw that from a random card here. So we have the Cruel Archers, Abomination, Unclean Spirits. So we have all of these uh, different um, enemies that you might fight there. But you also add a boss. And so in the second half of a skirmish game, you fight against one of the bosses. And the bosses here will be Antiochus, Baal, Eva, the Euphrates frogs, Herod, and Legion. And again, you will also get some lore on the back of those uh, based in Christian mythology. And each one of those bosses also has a small deck of cards. So if you were fighting um, Antiochus here, he would have a deck of darkness cards that would come out onto the board and cause bad things to happen. And he might also have some various talents that you can add depending on the difficulty that you have chosen to play the game in. I am playing the game right now on the easiest mode, so I'm not using any of the talents, but as a way to even further differentiate the minions from each other, if you want to add minor talents or major talents to the minions, these will also augment the minions and these will provide the minions with more powers. So if you want to step up uh, one difficulty level, you can add one minor talent to all of the demons that you're fighting. They might become more agile. Or they might have a casting power. They might be foul or hardy or one might be a leader or mischievous. And then in the major talents, if you want to bump up uh, to the next difficulty, you can also add a major talent to the demons. And they might be abusive or blighted or deceptive or guarded, massive, rugged, seductive or shrouded. And so there really is a lot of variety in this kind of skirmish mode. When you think about the different angels you can play, their different talents, the different loot they can have. And then we didn't even talk about the prayer deck. So the prayers are basically like spells. These are heavenly spells. And each of the angels has a way to gain prayer cards. And as you gain prayer cards, you can add them to your hand. You can have up to five prayer cards in your hand. And these will give you an additional power. So words of power or second wind, a lion's roar, uh, the golden rule the ward of protection, uphold the weak, uh, humanity, uh, humility of lions, high stance. And all of these are different. Each one of these is a completely different type of power that you can add. So you have so many options, so many different ways to build out your characters, so many different minions and different combinations of minions and the minions can have different talents. So there really is a lot going on on the technical level of this game. And I think it's really interesting and it, it also creates for some really interesting uh, conflict on the battle map. Let's talk a little bit about a turn here. One thing I didn't mention here is this darkness deck. And this darkness deck represents uh, the, the kind of threats. It's kind of a threat management system. And this darkness deck is full of all kinds of bad things that the demons are inflicting upon humanity. 
and they will cause bad things to happen. And if the darkness track ever fills up, then you have to start flipping the darkness cards over face up and then their powers will trigger. If that gets full, then the angels start taking damage. And so you have to think of the darkness as kind of a threat and you want to dispel the darkness as the angels. There is one more element on the board and those are these saint tokens. And these saint tokens are basically interactive, basically terrain that the demons and the angels are fighting over. As the angels move in uh, into adjacency to the saints, they will be flipped over to their protected side. And this will allow the angels to gain experience points. But as the demons move into adjacency to the saints, they might move back over to their oppressed side. And so it really is beneficial for the angels to protect these saints and push them over into their protected side. There are also a few tokens here, uh, damage tokens and tokens that will cover all of your basic kind of um, your basic afflictions, such as being cursed or being withered or perhaps being empowered. We have swift, we have shields and we have rooted and we also have blessed. And then we also have these courage tokens. And like I said, cur uh, courage is a currency that the angels can gain and spend by utilizing their certain powers. So let's do a couple game, let, let, let's do a, an example of a turn. Now this isn't a teach, so there might be some mistakes, but I did want to give you just kind of an example of how the game plays. So I did want to talk a little bit just in general about how different these two characters are of Asriel and Sardius. Sardius is an incredibly interesting character, especially in how he manipulates the battlefield. So each of the angels will have, usually their first power will be some kind of movement power. For instance, Uriel here, he gets one free movement, one free uh, activation of Scorch, and he can move up to three spaces and then deal one damage to an adjacent demon. So he moves up to a demon and deals damage. And then for an action, you can do that again. So you can move an additional three spaces and then deal one damage to adjacent demons. Very cool. Um, Osriel here has Spectral Walk, and I can use that once per turn for free, and then I can move up to two spaces. However, I can add one to this movement if I move through an angel or a demon with a maximum bonus of one per turn. And so the more, you know, he moves through people in order to gain speed. Sardius's movement is really interesting because he can actually only move one square. However, he says his uh, power is called Shifting Earth, and I can move up to three different targets without range. Any targets on the battlefield, I can move up to three different ones, one space, and that can include saints, angels, and demons. So while Sardius may only be able to move one space, he can pull demons into him. He can pull saints into him because he's actually manipulating the battlefield through this shifting earth power. I think that is super cool. And that just one little example just shows how different the angels are from one another. Uh, Tawalu, the wind walker, his movement power is called Serenity. He can move up to two spaces or heal one damage. Uh, Shula here, the Keeper of Light, she's light-footed. She can move up to three spaces and then add light to your space. And light, I believe this is a light token. I actually haven't played with Shula yet. Is light mentioned? Yes, light affects a space on the map. When an angel ends their turn in this space, they heal a damage. So she can create spaces on the battlefield that will allow angels to heal themselves. That is super cool. Uh, Michael, the Archangel, has advance for his movement power. Move up to two spaces. If you have at least five uh, courage, you may move one additional space. So Michael really wants to build up courage in order to move. And so just the, in, in the movement powers, you can see how different the characters play. And each one of their powers is that different. So that's really, really cool. Okay, but let's go back over to the table here. Now, um, it is the top of the turn. And it's the darkness turn and it is Sardius's turn to activate. But at the top of the turn, you do a darkness phase and the darkness phase is up here on the darkness board. And for each angel, you add a face down darkness card. So we're playing with two angels. So I'll add two face down darkness cards. 
And for each um, saint that is being oppressed, you add an additional darkness card. Now the darkness track now is filled up. I have all five darkness cards on that track there. The next time I have to add one, I start flipping them over and then a lot of bad stuff starts happening. So we need to try to figure out how to get rid of some of those darkness cards. Okay, but right now it is uh, Sardius's turn and he is here and he is surrounded by, let's see, I have a, a saint here. I have a Sandman here. Osriel is there. And then I also have a fallen Seraph there. And so there's this kind of a, this little scuffle going on here. So on um, Sardis' turn, I can do my shifting earth. I can cause things to move. I can move up to three targets on the battlefield, one space each. I'm going to pull, I think I will pull this saint a little closer. And I will also move the Fallen Seraph back one there. I am not going to move. I am going to stay in place here. And I think for my first action, so I have two actions as Sardius. For my first action, I can do a smashing action. And the smashing action is I can deal my, my green damage, which I think that is smiting. And I have a three damage there. And I can deal that to Fallen Seraph number one. So Fallen Seraph number one will take three damage. And so that is here on the one here. And actually on the one, this should be one here. So he takes three damage. So this Fallen Seraph here actually already has three damage and a wither token. Uh, at the beginning of, at the end of his turn, he should have taken one more damage because of that wither token. So I will add another damage to that Fallen Seraph. And then this Fallen Seraph is going to get uh, smashed by uh, Sardius. So he will take three more damage. So that brings him up to one, two, three, four. That brings him up to seven damage. So five, six, seven. And he has eight uh, hit points before he is destroyed. And so I think I will just go ahead and smash again for an example. That will do enough damage to kill the Fallen Seraph. So we'll take him off the board, take his uh, tokens, his hit points off the board, and he is worth two XP when defeated. So we will add two XP there. Okay, so uh, that is uh, both of Sardis's turns. So now we go to one of the demons, and the first demon on the initiative track here is the Sandman. Okay, so let's move the Sandman over here. So you can kind of see it in the camera here. So there is one Sandman left on the board. This Sandman here was defeated. So a Sandman, Sandman number two is left on the board. Uh, at, the stop, at the top of their turn, they do a Restless. So uh, move up to a, whatever they need to move, Infinity. Each Sandman moves adjacent to the nearest Saint. Now I am adjacent to the Saint already, so he will stay there. Now I think, I think this is the way you play. Uh, I have two of my Angels are adjacent to this Saint. So they are protecting him and only one... Uh, only one demon. So uh, the, the angels are able to protect this saint. The saint doesn't become oppressed because there are more angels than there are uh, than, than there are demons. So the saints, again, are kind of like contested uh, uh, terrain, contest, contested things that the angels and the demons are fighting over. And so that's what the Sandman might want to uh, move to other saints to to oppress them. But that won't happen. So now I will roll to see what the Sandman does on its uh, regular turn. So we'll flip over his activation token and a three sleepwalker. The Sandman moves adjacent to the demon with the lowest health. The de that demon moves three spaces towards the nearest angel and deals two damage. If it is adjacent, if the target demon is a Sandman, this demon uses its time freeze instead. Interesting. So the Sandman will actually help other demons. So the Sandman moves adjacent to the demon with the lowest health. Well, the demon with the lowest health is, health is actually this fallen Seraph who has full health. So the Sandman moves over here. And then that demon moves three spaces towards the nearest angel. One, two, three. And then deals two damage if it is adjacent. Okay, well... That's all that happens. So that's kind of like this weird kind of chest move there where huh, the Sandman moved across the board, activated this Fallen Seraph, and then the Fallen Seraph tried to attack one of the angels. Now on the battlefield, you will notice these red lines that are surrounded by this uh, blue haze here, this blue uh, highlight. 
Those are uh, spaces that block adjacency and they also block movement. And movement and range is all orthogonal. Nothing is diagonal in this game unless something is uh, infinity and then you can target anywhere on the board. So the Sandman has gone. So now it is Osriel's turn. Um, Osriel does have a level one talent. Uh, move up to two spaces before checking range. Uh, with your reaping skill. So my reaping skill is a thing that I can do. I can cause the strength damage and I can curse a, a, a demon. And a, a curse is a token that gets added to a demon or an angel. And anytime they do a test and they fail the test, they take damage. And a test in this game is usually really simple. You usually take 2d6 and it's usually a seven or higher and you pass the test. So I could curse this fallen seraph who has a test at the beginning of its turn. And if he fails that test, he will take a point of damage. But let's see here. What is Osriel going to do? Osriel can do spectral walk. I can move up to two spaces. Uh, he won't be able to get next to any of the demons. So I think I will move two spaces. So I'll move one, two. And then for one of my actions, I have two actions. I will do another movement of one, two. And then I will do an attack on this fallen seraph here. Actually, I think I'll hold back. And let's see here. One, two for my free movement. And then I think I will initiate my prayer power. And for Osriel to pray, I can draw one prayer card and then test on a seven or higher. So let's see what my prayer card is. Unwavering. Play on your turn as a free action. Target angel gains two shields. Each other angel gains one shield. Okay, that's pretty cool. Now let's do a test. So I'm trying to get a seven or higher. And I have an eight. So on a successful test, I can cast down a darkness card or remove an affliction or revive a defeated angel. I think I will cast down one of the darkness cards because I have the track full. So we will get rid of this darkness card. So this darkness card, the Lord of the Air gets discarded. Okay, now as a free action, I will play this prayer, this spell here, and I gain two shields and each of the other angels gains one shield. So let me find, uh, let me find my shields here. So uh, two shields for Osriel and one shield for Sardius. And so those will protect from incoming damage. And those are kind of a currency that I can spend. Now I do have one more power here. And let's see here. Um, I don't, so as a locust swarm, I could spend three courage to activate that. But right now Osriel has no courage, which is unfortunate. I do, I do gain one courage for, for praying, so I'll take that courage. If I do a reaping attack, I can gain another courage. But I think, um, let's see here. I think, I think I will just have Osriel pray again to gain another courage and another prayer card. And uh, Restraining Darkness, play on your turn as an action. So this is a new action I can take. Angels gain one courage for each darkness card on the board. Oh my gosh, that is awesome. So the more darkness cards on the board, the more courage I can gain. And I think you can have up to five courage. And now I can do another test. So a test of seven or up and a 12, excellent. So I can either cast down another darkness, remove an affliction or revive a defeated angel. And I think I'll just cast down another darkness. So I will go ahead and discard desensitized to violence. So that is now. So now I have two spaces open on my card and now are on my darkness track. And now it is the fallen Seraph's turn. So the fallen Seraph at the beginning of its turn, it will make a test. So uh, Juggernaut test seven higher. Uh, he rolled a six, so he failed. On success, each fallen seraph engages the nearest angel and deals one damage. Okay, so the juggernaut power does not trigger, but now he gets his action. So let's see what the fallen seraph is going to do. A three. Uh, cleaving sword. It's a range of one and a movement of five. So he will move to be orthogonally adjacent to Osrio. And the fallen seraph engages the nearest angel and then deals two damage to that angel and each other angel adjacent to the target. So luckily, Osriel and Sardius are not grouped together. So Osriel will take two damage, but I do have this two shields, so I will prevent that damage.
And then that goes on like that until all of the demons are defeated. And then you add two more boards to your battle mat. And then you set up a new minion. And then you randomly draw one of the Princes of Darkness to fight. And then you have a minion and boss fight. And if you do that, you win that skirmish. Really interesting. I think the battles are fun. The powers are fun. The different talents, the different loot and uh, the, the the prayers, the different spells that you can get, all of these things combined together make for some really, really interesting skirmish gameplay. So the skirmish mode is quite accelerated because as you gain XP in between each turn, you can level up and your, your angels can get loot and can get their talents pretty quickly. When you play through the campaign mode, it's a little bit slowed down because you can't level up during a mission, you level up in between missions and you do have these character sheets and the character sheets here have all of these little places for you to spend experience. And so you can level up your braveness or you can be composed or disciplined. You can level up your stats by spending XP and then you can unlock your talents by filling in each one of these circles for one XP. So as your angels gain experience in the campaign mode, you will slowly be filling in these circles and leveling up your character. Now, what's really interesting is you have three slots for talents on your angels, but you could at the beginning of a game, if you had uh, three level one powers unlocked, you could fill up all of your talents with level one powers. And at the beginning of each game, you get access to not specific powers, but to a number of powers. And so you don't unlock just one talent, you unlock the access to one talent. And so you might be able to have a level one talent, level one talent, and a level two talent or something like that. And so each game, you can kind of respec your angel to, uh, to, to take the, the talents in that you want. And then you can also keep track of the weapons that you have unlocked, the weapons, the helm, the chest, the gloves, and the legs. So all of your heavenly treasure, you can keep track of that. And then you can also swap out that gear from one game to the next. It's a pretty cool system, I think. I haven't actually played the campaign yet. I've only played the skirmish mode, but we'll take a little look here at the... Um, at the, at the first mission in, in the campaign. So the campaign, the, the mission setup, it'll show you which enemies you are fighting. It'll show you how to lay out your tiles and then it'll give you a little story and then a reward section for if you beat that or not. And I think there are, there are 12 missions in this book for the campaign. And then there is kind of an end game scenario here that is hidden in this box. But uh, overall, you do get a lot of stuff in this game. And I think the skirmish mode, which is what I have played, has been actually a lot of fun. I love the variety in the angels. I love the variety in their talents and their treasures and the prayers. And I also like the variety of the enemies and how they work and how you can add talents to things and always uh, make things a little different. I like the variety of their powers. And I like the way that they, the board gets manipulated a lot. This isn't one of those skirmish games where you just kind of everybody moves together and stays there and just rolls dice until enemies die. There is a lot of movement on the battlefield. And so I think it's pretty interesting. But overall, I think this game comes with a lot of stuff. You get a lot of game out of it. Okay, so now let's talk about the, 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 the Christian part of this game. You know, is this game preachy? And I think I come from this from a somewhat interesting perspective, or at least it's interesting to me. And the fact that, you know, I was raised uh, Christian by two Christian ministers, but we had pretty, uh, pretty liberal Christianity. We, we weren't super strict. Um, but that does give me some insight into some of the things going on. And overall, I don't think this game is very preachy, except for one element. And there are Bible verses scattered throughout. You will have some Bible verses on the backs of your prayer cards and that kind of thing. Um, each of the angels will have a little bit of lore, which the lore is kind of a mix of fantasy and biblical mythology, Christian mythology. But then you will also have a Bible verse for inspiration over here. But if you're worried about that, or if you just don't want to pay attention to it, you could ignore it, or you could just read it as mythology, which is how I have been approaching all of this. 
I approach all of the world's religions as mythology and some of the world's religions religions are have better mythology than others. And I think for a kind of demonic warfare game, uh, Christian mythology is pretty interesting to create this kind of game. However, the darkness deck is is one area where I'm I'm not thrilled with how they handled this from that perspective because the darkness deck represents things represents afflictions that the demons are are unleashing on humanity. And some of them are okay like seeds of fear, arrogant arrogance, live by the sword. But we start to get into some ones like sexual immorality. Okay, so I know growing up I had a lot of evangelical friends and uh I know that there are a couple things that uh, a lot of Christians think about when they see these two words, sexual immorality. One of those things is homosexuality. Uh, another one of those things is uh, sex before marriage, the big one, sex before marriage. Now, we know, those of us who aren't Christian, know that those things are not sexually immoral. <laughs> no more sexually immoral than heterosex is. No more sexually immoral than sex after marriage is. So I'm just not sure what they were thinking of when they said that this is a darkness that the demons are spreading. What were the designers, what are they trying to convey here with sexual immorality? And then there are ones like manic depression. So manic depression being a a, a demonic infliction, I think kind of does a disrespect to the idea of mental health, of mental illness. So depression is not a demonic uh, influence. Depression is a real disease. It is as real as something like cancer or diabetes or uh, asthma or high blood pressure. It is a infliction that requires medical attention and, and medicine and uh, psychiatry and uh, constant vigilance by the person suffering from it, just as somebody who is suffering from something like di uh, diabetes or asthma would. And so I think kind of putting this in the realm of demonic influence, I think is a little weird. And there are just a few others like that. Uh, keeping appearances. Well, there's nothing wrong with wanting to look nice. Um, social loneliness, uh, prideful heart, marital unfaithfulness, spiritual static. And so I just, I, I think that this deck would have been better handled if it didn't name these, if it just had maybe some art, some weird, creepy, demonic art, and then a game effect. I think naming these and assigning these these things like manic depression, like sexual immorality, like suicidal thoughts, I think that is kind of passing judgment on things. And it could lead to some people feeling very uneasy about some of this stuff and, and kind of pushing that into the realms of demonic influence. Yeah, so I'm not really sure about this deck. I think it was mishandled. And I think this could have been handled a lot better in ways that maybe weren't as preachy, in, in ways that maybe weren't kind of passing judgment on things. But I really do think that's kind of the only place where this game kind of falls into that Christian trapping. Now, it is definitely a Christian game. It's made by Christian people. But I think it is first and foremost a very well-made game. You get a lot of cool stuff. It doesn't feel like a cheap religious cash-in like a lot of the Christian entertainment did when I was growing up. This feels first and foremost like a well-made fantasy skirmish game that just so happens to be based on Christian mythology. Now, Christians may not consider this mythology. They might consider this a kind of a, a uh, metaphorical depiction of spiritual warfare, and uh, that would be okay for them to do so. But I think if you approach this game just as a fantasy game based off of one of the world's religions, um, a lot like uh, Ghost Stories. Uh, Ghost Stories, one of my favorite game, is has some like Taoist uh, things in it. I don't know if I have any other games that are really 
Well, anything that's based on, you know, God of War on the PlayStation, that's based off of a um, off of a world's <laughs> off of a mythology of an old religion. There are games like that. Um, do I have anything else that is kind of based off of anything like that? I'm not sure. I have to think about that. But it is interesting to think about. And I don't feel like the game is overly preachy. I don't think that this game would really upset uh, people who are coming to it from a non-Christian point of view, except for maybe some of the things in this darkness card I think are a little bit questionable, or this darkness deck, just a little bit questionable in, 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 in trying to discern what the designers were thinking of when they made some of these. And so maybe they can come into this video and comment and let us know what they were thinking of, you know, to the designer, what is the designer thinking of when when he says something is sexually immoral? And I think that is actually uh, pretty important to know. And that could go a long way in, I think, uh, helping people determine whether or not they want to support this game. So overall, I think Deliverance is a pretty cool skirmish game. It has a lot going for it. And there's only a little bit of hesitation on my part with that darkness deck. So, all right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this look at Deliverance. We will talk to you later. Bye-bye.